uh, the last slot of the last day. Uh, I've got a question for you though before we start. How many people do you need in a room before someone will spontaneously offer an answer to a question? Fewer than 20. You were in the last session, weren't you? You were, yeah. It, it's, uh, it's fewer than this. Um, and one of the challenges of um, chairing or moderating one of these groups is when you politely ask for questions, nobody's got any. So they have, because they're in their head. Um, Slido, S-L-I dot D-O is a service that we're using. If you go to sli.do, Slido, on your device and use the hashtag, I'll do it right this time, hashtag retail show 18. Retail show 18. And you can ask questions um, uh, as we go. And then uh, uh, Ian, uh, Ian from Cyberteal will, um, uh, will be able to see those questions as you go um, and, uh, and put them to the panel. Um, I'm going to get out of the way because you've got the weirdness of somebody chairing and somebody moderating. So I'm going to leave Ian to it. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. When myself and the panellists were sat in the lounge thinking about this meeting, we were thinking how many people are actually going to be here. Um, last session, last day. Um, so the first question to me is how many retailers are in the room? If you could raise your hands, please. Okay, that's encouraging and um, I hope that you will find our debate useful on the future of retail. I think it's a given that technology will impact the future of retail in more ways than just in store. And it's difficult for retailers to know where to invest and it's difficult to tell the difference between a PR stunt, a genuine service that you can offer to customers. With that in mind, I'm starting by asking the panellists to put their consumer hats on and to think as if they are consumers and identify what they think a shopper will find most useful and least useful in store. So starting with, I should have actually so forgot, I should have introduced, I was expecting you to do it. So, <laughs> Ian at Cybertill, Karen from um, Drop It Shopping, Igor from Petrovich, Petrovich? Yes, what is that? That's what you can do, you left me to do it, thank you. Then for the Debold next door, and at the far end, Alex from Photo. So, starting with Carrie, what do you think retail is lacking right now? Um, do you want to expo explore that, particularly understanding what most people buy offline, even if they buy online, any stats or information you've got about that to share with the audience? Okay, hi. Thank you for coming. Um, I'll just introduce myself shortly. I'm Karen Kabili. I'm the founder and CEO of Drop It Shopping. Um, it's been a few years now that I um, deep uh, in the technology world, fo focusing on the physical retail space, where 81% of our purchases in fashion retail are completed. And I think one of the things that answering your question. Uh, that we need to start looking at is how do we create a more convenient experience using technology not trying to change the shopping experience because most of our clients that are, are visiting shopping sites or shopping districts the ones that are really valuable for us the ones that are high spenders let's say the ones that really complete sales are less looking for gadgets but are looking to ease the experience of shopping so how can we solve problems like taking their bags away how can we make um, the shopping experience when they try on uh, clothes in the fitting room, how can we make sure that it's more convenient, more easy? How can we use technology to educate our store assistants to give a better service? And I think that we're seeing a lot of front-end technology that is appearing both in the shopping centers uh, sector, which I specialize in, and in the retail space that are more gadgets. So using very cool things, moving to the Disneyland model, people coming for the experience and most likely would end up purchasing something instead of focusing in technology that can take the real shopping experience as we know it, what we like to do as um, women and gentlemen, uh, come into a store and actually how do we help them um, get to a point of purchase and not how do we keep them in store in order to play with uh, different technology that they could do uh, in amusement parks or back home with their computers. So I think focusing mostly and enhancing the existing experiences we know it and not trying to change it. This is my point of view. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, then, um, moving on to you as a large interface for tier one retailers, what's your view on this subject? Hello. Excellent. There we go. Uh, good afternoon, Ben Gale, uh, VP and Managing Director of Devon Vikstov. We uh, work and integrate with most of the, the world's top retailers, but also convenience retailers as well. So a pleasure to be speaking here. Um, for me, strangely, in the world of today where everything is about brand and about understanding what that brand means to people, I do feel that some of our retailers have become a little lost. I feel that they either try to push for an online brand or they try and pursue offline brand. And to me, it's about that connection of journey connection of experience between on and offline and actually start to personalize things. If you see stuff in the press at the moment, uh, retailers are either going for volume, so you take Sainsbury's and, and Asda coming together to try and uh, get economies of scale, or it's about value. And it's the value bit I think we need to get back to. So for me, that's a it's a bespoke uh, way of working. It's about personalization. It may well be about what's important to my health, uh, but it's about simplicity and convenience and making sure I get all of the facts and figures that I need to help me on that journey and to help me choose which retailers I want to work with. Okay, thank you. There really is so much choice um, that retailers are faced with and as such as tech leaders in this industry, I think we need to think what we're doing to communicate this um, to the retailers. So if we move on to Alex, um, can you talk about Vodafone, Vodafone's journey, the Internet of Things, and how you're communicating that to the retailers and how that technology is being used by consumers in store? Yeah, sure. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, uh, IoT within retail is, uh, retail's vertical is down scaled slightly, you know, the top four or five verticals that are investing in IoT. But uh, the areas that we're seeing investment in IoT and retail are three main areas, firstly in the store, secondly in the supply chain, so at a basic level connecting a vehicle or connecting things within a vehicle, and thirdly uh, connecting a product that the retailer would like to sell. And I think the focus should be uh, on the store. Uh, to Karen's point, most sales are still made in the store, and it's about how you improve the experience. Uh, and we're doing a lot of work around the IoT to do that in store. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately, there's two areas that will be focal points in the store. Firstly is the experience side of things. So how can you improve um, the experience that the consumer has in the store? And secondly, also convenience, which we'll talk about a bit more uh, throughout this panel, but convenience, depending on the subsector. So a lot of subsectors are more focused on convenience and more focused on making sure the consumer can get in the store, get what they want, because these days, often consumers know what they want before they go in. Uh, and making that possible uh, and a seamless experience uh, for the consumer. Thank you. Karen, taking that and looking at in-store and optimising stock um, for the radius of same-day delivery, how can you take that technology, that thought, into, you know, have you got any stats or anything you can share with us about that going forward? Okay, so just uh, explaining a bit what Dropit does, my company. Uh, we provide a hands-free shopping experience uh, in shopping districts and shopping centers. And I can, I'm can i going to actually introduce um, the, an answer um, how I got to the point that Drop It came into life because I met the problem myself as a consumer. So I think, uh, like, like giving you this example, I was walking in New York uh, a few years back uh, on my way to a business meeting with, with my old company and I found shoes, Chanel boots, 70% off. Really wanted to purchase them, but I couldn't come with a Chanel bag into my client's office. It didn't look very nice. And I tried to deliver the, the boots back to the hotel, and they couldn't do it. They didn't have a proposition for delivery that includes um, insurance and all of the convenience that comes with that. So I tried to understand how can we create a solution which is affordable, for the customer, because I think this is one of the biggest points that we need to remember when we um, when we present new technology or new experience for consumers. It has to be an affordable consumer uh, experience. And what I reach out to understand is that it's all about the network effect. So what Dropit does, we connect all the retailers in a certain area, and we allow consumers to drop their bags in different stores. All the bags are consolidated to one delivery, 
and that optimizes all the supply chain. So we can make sure that in one price of one delivery, which is the opposite of the online, so using uh, the space of the physical world where everybody shops at the end of the day, bringing the convenience of not carrying bags that has a direct effect on the dwell time and the average transaction value of a customer. So we can recognize that a customer that doesn't carry his bags with him shops more. And we can show stacks. We're partnered with more than 150 brands um, from Jimmy Choo to uh, Topshop tomorrow, for example, um, and many more. And we can see that the average transaction value of a customer that doesn't remember what he carried is many percentage more. I can't uh, share the stats. So I think that bringing the experience of the delivery back to the physical world, the benefits of the online, because the online creates a lot of, let's say, this optimization. Uh, for for all the players in, in the supply chain, for the retailers, uh, for the courier companies, for everybody that serves um, the shared customer. But in the physical world, uh, if we combine and we come together as a group, all the retailers on a certain site, we can really optimize it and feedback it back to the consumer in an affordable way. So, yeah. Thank you. Ego, you've shared some stats with us, which I'd like you to share with the audience about how many volume of transactions that you do online, volume of transactions, or volume of transactions on the telephone, and bring that into how you get the physical store, the online store to work together, and more importantly, how that affects the shop staff within store using that te using technology. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have uh, in the other company, 40% of our uh, sales comes from online quarter and 30 from a uh, call center so our uh, we, tra we, we trade uh, we the building materials merchants like uh, here like a juice and like uh, Jerry Perkins kind of this and uh, most of our not most of most of our uh, half of, of our sales come from uh, tradesmen and of course they are using the online and um, call center but 30% also comes from uh, offline, off, offline sales. And I want to say one thing, many, many talks right now about the bridging the, the gap between uh, online and offline, like how to connect. Um, I have uh, to, uh, to, uh, to remind the Matrix movie. You remember that uh, the retailers has uh, understand uh, the truth, that there is no spoon, so there is no gap between online and offline in the head of consumers. There is only one brand and uh, one brand that consumer can communi communicate and online, offline, it's just a different interfaces. So when you realize that uh, there is no spoon, you realize that the, that is not, not the spoon that bends, that's only ourselves, the retailers. So uh, we created uh, the only channel customer journey where the, we take the DIY process, the renovation process uh, as a process, as a long process with the several touch points with the brand. And on some of these journeys, uh, of customer journey, customers uh, has to come to our offline stores to choose the decorative materials, styles, wallpapers, and so on. And on some uh, stages, they don't have to come to uh, the stores because they, you don't have to touch and feel uh, the bag, uh, the bag of cement, 50 kilos. So I mean, it's useless. So you, you just you can call, or go online. And when you think it's as a process, as a solid process, and the brand communicates with a solid uh, with you as a solid brand, you will understand that yeah, there is no spoon. So then, thinking about taking that further, what do you think the role of gadgets in store is? Um, in helping the shop start to engage with consumers. Yeah, and I think for me, when you look at how we, we engage, uh, we're a business to business organization. We sell to retailers. And you kind of think retailers are B to C. To me, I like to almost flip it on its head and say the retailers should be C to B. They should be totally understanding how their consumers engage with them, how they work with them, how they want to be served. So take a uh, the concept of Amazon Go effectively a full frictionless experience where you go in, you choose what you want, and you simply leave. Now that might sound strange coming from an organization that sells a lot of point of sale, but to us, understanding how that frictionless journey 
impacts and influences people, I think is great to see. Uh, I can also see a lot of gadgets as we may well see them, but it's about security. So how do you trust your identity? How do you make sure that your payments are secure? Uh, you may well be using uh, biometrics, you may well be using uh, uh, facial recognition, things like that, and trying to find a, a way to work. It may well also be a gadget like RFID, which let's be honest has taken quite a while to take off, but to us now, the speed and frictionless ability of taking RFID and doing full basket reconciliation instantly, instantaneously, is a fantastic thing to, to look to see. You also have the behind the scenes gadgets, which to us are, are the data lakes that people are collecting. You know, what Amazon knows about you, what Facebook knows about you, what top retailers know about you. You know, that's good, they've got payment data, they've got loyalty data, but then you also have to look at how that gadget is effectively used. We've got GDPR coming down. So how are you actually able to use that data in an effective way to communicate with your customers to make sure that personalization is relevant but not intrusive and doesn't leave people feeling they're being oversold to. So I think gadgets are exceptionally important if used well in that C to B, consumer to business, because the consumers will vote with their feet or their eyeballs or their fingers and they won't come back to you if they feel that they're being um, taken advantage of. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think for me it's uh, interesting referencing Amazon Go because uh, Amazon Go at the moment is, I mean, we don't know exactly what it is, but it's it's definitely, uh, you know, it's one concept to store, I think, in London and one in San Francisco. Um, and so that what that tells us is that getting to that point is, is definitely not the short, medium term future, but it does show us that there is going to be a focus on convenience in certain subsectors. And it's more about how we get to that point in the short, medium term future because we can't just jump there um, uh, as an industry. And an interesting uh, sort of industry that's related to retail, which is vending, is an industry which is seeing huge growth and it's actually starting to creep into retail in a similar way to the concept of Amazon Go. So through a vending machine uh, based on IoT innovation, you can now connect it and know exactly what's in the machine. Uh, what the temperature or humidity is of the machine, uh, firstly, and secondly, you can take car payment. And those two things sound quite simple, but they re they've revolutionized the industry because now you can sell higher margin goods, which is an incentive for the vending industry to actually push their industry into retail. So, for example, things like makeup, which is, which is being sold through vending now, electronics, um, talking about hot uh, humidity and temperature, you can now buy pizza, in certain instances, buying pizza through a vending machine, flowers, etc. So what that's showing, I think, is that the drive for convenience is being forced into retail through another vertical, and I think that will be the uh, pathway towards getting to an Amazon Go, uh, Amazon Go type environment where there's definitely necessity for the consumer, um, but you know there really needs to be a solid business case and uh, you know return for the, for the brand. Thank you. I think we all accept that you know technology is changing, and it's um, people who are a lot younger than me that are changing that technology. Um, if anyone has any late teenage children, um, like me, you probably can't speak to them. On my way home in the evening, I get in the car every night and I try and dine my children independently to find it's diverted to voicemail. And then while I'm driving down the road, I have to illegally type a text which just says "call me," and then eventually when they get the text, they ring me back. So thinking about Gen Z. I think you know we've done some research on the, uh, Gen Z, and you know, is our organisation we're thinking about how they are going to shape the future of technology. So thinking about Gen Z, I'll start again with Alex. Sorry, um, you know, you talked about selfie generation and how brands are going to engage with them going forward. You know, and then if we all have a think about the Gen Z generation and how we're going to communicate with them and how retailers are going to leverage the shopping power that's coming 25% of the population is Gen Z and they're going to be the shoppers of the future. Yeah, I think without doing a deep psychoanalysis of uh, Gen Z, that it's definitely obvious that they're very different. I think one interesting way they're different is the way that they uh, consume media. So they spend pretty much all their day consuming media, consuming photos, videos, memes, uh, whatever. And I think somehow capturing that attention in a store is, could be really powerful. I think it's already been done in retail, but to be more focused on that uh, would really benefit a lot of brands. And some examples of things like um, focusing more on pop-up shops. And there was a story uh, today or yesterday in which Macy's have made an investment in experimental retail. 
are focusing on trying to link social media into a store. So when some when a Gen Z customer comes into the store, how do you give them an option to um, you know sort of self congratulate themselves of being in the store? Of which again there are examples of, but more work could be done in that area. And I think thirdly, relating to Gen Z would be changing the way that they are rewarded. So typically, brands reward consumers by uh, financial incentives, by giving them discount or whatever. I think Gen Z don't just respond to that as well as previous generations. Um, the, the retail industry needs to be more smart about how they incentivize a uh, consumer without just focusing on financial incentives. I, I totally agree. Uh, Gen Z is not about loyalty. They're not interested in VIP events. They're more interested in how you as a retailer engage with them and communicate with them the, the latest range of products. So if I take that to Karen, what are your thoughts on Gen Z generation, how they're shopping? Um, it's a big question because we can see uh, through our experience with, uh, with the younger generation, they compare prices. So how do, you, how do you make sure that when they're in the store and they have the ability to just pop in? Because we, have, we can see that 13% of all shoppers and 70% of them are young generation that is comparing prices within the same brand. So as we know, we're selling the same product through different channels and how do we align that? that uh, maybe give them the best price that they can find online in the store, find ways to complete the sale when they're in, in your own store somehow using that uh, ability and channel. Okay. So Ego, you said 40% of your transactions are online through the telephone, through the second store. How do you address the showrooming aspect that people are doing? How do you link that together between the different channels that you're operating? You know, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, well, we, uh, as I told, uh, we try to, uh, we take uh, the customer journey as a process and we, uh, for example, when customer come to choose the, uh, the decorative materials, we realize that he doesn't want to pull the heaviest stuff on the trolley. I mean, it's, a, it's a crazy, uh, they will break uh, the neck uh, and the back, sorry. <laughs> um, his back. Uh, so we get rid of old stocks in our uh, showrooms. We just uh, in our stores. We just uh, leave the showrooms. Very nice uh, in, uh, innovation and uh, emotional showrooms. And we put the price, uh, the NFC on the uh, NFC chip on the every price tag. We give to every customer the tablet, uh, which is unusual in DIY retailing and, and the, for, uh, especially unusual for guys who are selling the cement, 50 kilos. And uh, the customers, they take the tablet or they use their uh, our own app and uh, make a basket. And uh, he's the, the customer, they're thinking about the, what product to choose rather than uh, how to, how will I bring it to, my, uh, to, the, to the trolley and then to the car. And we deliver within two hours after, after he pick up and make a basket after the ch ch checkout he can check out online and uh, thinking forward we are creating uh, as far as we cannot build uh, the huge uh, the shops everywhere we are thinking to create the digital showrooms uh, with the, where they can uh, choose the decorative materials on the screen so uh, pretending to, to be sitting in his room so we, are, we will use the, the screen that will go to malls I mean, we, we are trying to think how to uh, make uh, customer journey more convenient. And I think we will, uh, thinking like this, we will win customers. Continuing that theme and talk about install technology, I think the question is, is it just gadgets? Is it in-store customer service or can it be both? So if we start with carrying first, you suggest that it's not really tech, that it's actually you know, the retailers is invested, it's more having staff, training, etc. And the brand is making the experience more seamless with the consumer. Yeah, so I think that uh, retail has shifted. Uh, I don't know if nobody in the room remembers, but a hundred years ago you would go into a store and a store assistant would pull the product from a drawer. There was no, there's no visible item and they would choose for you. And there would be a face-to-face -face kind of conversation because the salesperson was specializing in fashion or whatever he's selling. And I think with time, because we've turned the store into a warehouse, because you go into a Zara or a Primark or whatever store you go into, and there's so many products and everything is 
you know, a big, a big miss. Um, and and the store assistants they are more running after fixing the items and cleaning the stores than giving service. And I think that we can use technology um, also in that element too. Like, how do we train the staff? Maybe by uh, offering products like gamings. Uh, we're looking at a product now that we're building with some of our brands uh, to educate the store assistant the importance and the values of giving a better service to the consumer and how to offer things, etc. So we compensate them. Uh, in the end of the day, they are on minimum range. So if you can give them any compensation, if it's a, if it's a, you know, a money to buy uh, to go on the tube or different type of ways to enhance that and also in the American market we recognize that uh, there's a huge there is a huge startup upcoming that I've just met uh, which is very interesting to look at because what they do and I don't have any engagement with them I just saw it so I, I think uh, I would like to share it and they actually give the store assistant the ability to keep selling on their online channels as, uh, as online uh, assistants uh, when they're home so they can more make more money if they make more sales. So how do you engage back the store assistant to your brand that they would be brand ambassadors again? So I think that's it's a it's a cool way of, of engaging uh, and having more and more ambassadors out there using technology. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, ben, do you have a point of view? Uh, most definitely. Back to the Gen Z piece. To, to me, there are two sides of the coin. There's the digital immigrant, people like my nan, who's not used technology all her life, she still has a mobile phone with a piece of paper stuck on the back with a list of her you know, frequently dialed numbers because she doesn't trust the technology. We have my nephew who does everything by voice. He doesn't even type anything in these days. So when you look at some of the ways of, of working, we still need to give choice. We can't just switch everything to Gen Z and expect all of the demographics to work with it. That said, I think there are ways that we can start to use the ways that people work in Gen Z to inform the ways that we look forwards. So what's the favorite thing of Gen Z? Taking selfies. You know, if you look at people like Yoti, uh, who are in the room as well today, you know, they're actually taking selfie to do form identification, to actually say, this is me, this is who I am. Um, I think gamification is gonna come in, so the ability to make a store a destination, to actually bring people back into that store, not as a gadget, I saw one online the other day which was where they take taken a surf store, they used to just sell board shorts and they put an actual surf wave generating machine in the centre of the store. Fantastic way to generate footfall and bring people who are passionate about that brand back in. You look at Burberry where they do uh, fashion shows, rock concerts actually in the store to bring people in, to make it an absolute destination. And then I think if you look at some of the things that uh, Gen Z and ourselves looking forwards. We're also interested in uh, good social behaviours of retailers but also ec ecological behaviours. I think it was Iceland this week that said they weren't going to use any more palm oil. We're doing a lot of work in reverse vending which you may well see as a, a gadget which is effectively a deposit return scheme which means that you take your single use plastic bottle, you pay a deposit on it and then you bring it back into the store. And I think that's important as we it may well be seen as a gadget, however, there's 8.8 .8 billion plastic bottles in the UK used every year. We return 57% of those. That leaves 3 billion bottles and cans going into waste, landfills going into our ecosystem, going into our ocean. So I think that retailers will increasingly look to be more socially aware, ecologically aware, because I think that is the, the future of how we should all work and operate. Thank you very much. Taking that thing, you know, Ben's highlighted some retailers that are doing some great stuff with technology. But in general, I think retailers are a little bit slow to take on new technology and sometimes it's viewed as risky. So if the panel can think about why is it taking retailers so long to invest in new technologies. So, start with Ego. Yeah, I think uh, mentality. The retailers uh, think, uh, are thinking that uh, if uh, the big boxes or the, uh, the way how they um, sell the products for 50 years worked in the uh, last 50 years, maybe this will work uh, in the future. This, this will not. I mean, the retail will change dramatically. And uh, the major problem of, uh, the, of the slow changing is uh, here, in the head. So. No. 
Uh, yeah, so, so uh, we, we do a brochure every year called the Vodafone IoT Barometer, and we interview 2,000 CEOs specifically on IoT and its adoption and why it's not being adopted or is. And there's three main reasons why in retail it's not being adopted as quickly as other verticals. Uh, the first is uh, funding, which is always an issue. Uh, the second is internal resource, and the third is uh, business case, or seeing it happen in the market. The third is, I think now it's, it, there are plenty of examples from my area of, of IoT of uh, it being adopted in retail. Uh, the second, in terms of uh, internal resource, is something I think that really needs to be focused on in retail, around who is going to take responsibility, which comes up in these sort of events a lot, who has accountability for the technology. And uh, the last one uh, around funding, uh, well, you know, you see the first adopters of technology often in retail, the ones with the highest margins, obviously. So we see a lot of fashion brands taking the lead, uh, a lot of luxury brands like Burberry, as mentioned before. Um, but yeah, those are three issues. I think the main one to focus on is, is resourcing internally and who's going to take on these types of projects. Karen? Um, yeah, so uh, my view is a bit different. I think that we can all recognize that retail is a family business. Uh, of many years and I think it goes generation by generation. They specialize for many years in the same way of working. Uh, I think the revolution of online has affected uh, the thought that they need to start and use technology and we can recognize that most of the technology within the retail space um, is a front-end technology as I said. So it's digital forms and I think that they have spent a lot of money um, uh, trying to create apps that gives you information, tells you uh, where to find them, opening hours, literally digital form. And I think that because they used their budgets and they didn't see any take up, uh, they're more cautious about how they spend their budgets. And we can also see it in our space. They don't give enough attention. You know, it's not like they choose one or two services and they really focus. Um, just to compare it to the online, uh, even if we take Amazon, it took 10 years to change behavior uh, in, in the consumer behavior and I think that their expectation here is to trial their different services and if it doesn't work uh, after six or seven or eight months uh, they give up on it and they move to the new thing and it's a bit of a problem it's not enough time in order to really change and create a revolution uh, of how people shop and how do they adopt products uh, especially that each one of the brands are adopting different type of technology it's really hard to educate across the market there is a miss out there's no marketplace to there is no connection. So if, if you want to take different sectors and you want to change your behavior in consumer side, we have to make sure that, that we can see it available across an industry because um, this is one of the challenges being a physical a physical space. So the online doesn't have the effect of, you know, it's, it's available everywhere and you can market it and you can retarget customer on a return on investment basis and stuff like that that is missing in the physical world. So I think um, the challenge is to come together. Thank you. We've got 10 minutes at the end for questions, which means I've got now about four minutes to ask the panel one more question. So I'm going to ask them to be short and punchy. For each of you, start with you then, what do you think are the two technologies that are most important to retailers to investing in now for the future? Uh, I think I've mentioned a couple of them already. So I believe that recycling technology, how we treat our planet with more fairness and respect is key and will continue to drive that decision. And I also think the, uh, the onset of RFID and how that's going to affect the, the shopper's journey. So they're my two tips for the future. Okay, Igor? Yeah, to my mind, the, uh, the client's ecosphere. So go very deep to the uh, understanding how uh, client behave a client's um, uh, customer journey and create the ecosphere around it. So the customer will never uh, get off of this uh, uh, ecosphere, and the second is uh, big data, big data personalization, which is also very, good, uh, very good knowing about your customers. So knowing about your customers is the, the major thing, like always. Um, um, I have to say IoT, uh, and uh, you know I think IoT from our perspective we're growing 20% year on year, so there's huge growth on other industries more so than retail. So I think mean, retail needs to catch up a bit. We've also launched our own consumer platform, which is now in both phone stores, and um, I'll just leave it on IoT. I'm just going to actually stop you and say you can't say IoT. So <laughs> thanks for not. <laughs> it's okay. Spoke this on him. What do you think retailers should be investing? It's not IoT. 
Uh, I think I would say the, the topic we've talked about quite a bit, social media, I think specifically integration of social media into the store environment, which hasn't been done too much so far. Okay. Great. Um, uh, I'll just finally. add, um, I think uh, optimization of stock, I think we're missing a lot of in that space as well. Um, so how do we optimize between the online and the offline and, and make sure, you know, h &M just published $3.4 billion of uh, stock that they can't sell. And next to it, that they just mentioned, and they said, if we, if we keep catering both channels, by 2023, we will use all the cotton in the world. So it cannot, it cannot represent itself. So in a way, uh, we talked about the universe. I think optimizing the stock is one of the most important things. So. Totally agree. So I believe now there's the ability for you to ask questions electronically, but no one's told me how to do it. So yes, people have been doing that. Pardon? People have been doing it. I haven't seen it, don't know, so help me out here. Oh, here we are. Okay. Start with Ben. How will future post stations look? Will it be mobile or static? I, honestly, I believe it will be a combination. Uh, I think that there will be a high touch, mid touch and low touch. By high touch I mean somebody that actually concierges you through the shopping experience, through mobility, through mid touch I believe that will be the type of point of sales that we see where you have somebody actually to, to do the teller system and then I think low touch will be more uh, cashless, card only, self checkout uh, and that's the way that it will effectively go, three ways, high touch, mid touch, low touch. Okay. Alex, same question. Yes, uh, I think um, well, from speaking from an IoT perspective, there's a lot more possibilities now around moving the point of sale in the store. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a fixed point. However, we're still at a point where culturally we have to go to a till to pay. But technologically, that, that's not actually well, that's not actually true. You know, you can put the point of sale anywhere now with uh, with the right connection. So I think um, answering the question, I think we'll see a lot more mobile and we'll see a lot more payment points related to how the store looks, which will change based on what we're talking about around experiences in the store, etc. Okay, I think the next question is unfair to some of the panelists as we ask ourselves to retail technology. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Igor, do you have a view? You're not like to obsess anyone in the UK? <laughs> I think the, the, well, the, the mobile will be more, more and more, uh, more and more deep, goes deep into our lives. So I mean, the, the mobile, even not mobile, but uh, cheap in the in the arm will be the our experience. Yeah. Okay. So I think the next question was, what part of the retail brand? So what part of the retail brands that we know today do you think will still be here in ten years time? Does anyone feel brave enough to answer that? Okay, um, you, it's, a, it's a hard one. You're yes. kind of in a bad position. Um, I can talk about fashion retail okay. uh, because that's where I specialize. Uh, I think that as we recognize that uh, we have 200 brands that duplicate themselves in 4,000 sites around the world and are here for 80 years plus, I don't think that they're going to disappear. Uh, not at all. So I do believe that um, the small brands will maybe disappear or consolidate under one umbrella, one stop shop, uh, department stores, pop-up stores, etc. But I can't see the big, uh, the big brands uh, really disappearing. They just need to optimize their the way of uh, manufacturing, which was damaged by the online experience. That's that's mostly it for me. Well, frankly, I hope there's still a large proportion around. But in today's environment, businesses start, businesses flourish, businesses occasionally fail. I do see back to the stock piece. Some smaller businesses working with aggregators, so whether that's a, an ASOS or somebody else who actually enables an online marketplace to bring your goods to market cheaper, faster, more efficiently, I think aggregators will actually help smaller brands continue to, to flourish. And back to that piece of volume and value, I think at the volume end it's very difficult. You've got to be very um, good on your stock control. On the value side, it's great to have uh, boutique organizations which sometimes flourish and grow even larger. So I think the proportion will shift in terms of ones we know today or may well not be around tomorrow, but hopefully they'll be replaced with newer, different and, and brighter things. We don't end up with a vision like Blade Runner or something like that. So. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. 
And Alex, if we go on to the next question now, what's the most effective way for small independent retailers to compete with established brands online? No, is there a spoon or not? Um, I think we'll do the spoon or not. I think we need to get an answer on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think related to the last question, I actually think smaller brands have a massive opportunity at the moment, and they're a huge threat, especially in the UK, towards large brands for a couple of reasons. The first reason is um, that I think there's a general trend, especially a younger generation, of going away from brands and being more skeptical because the information available about how they operate, etc. Uh, and secondly, because, you know, the min specifically in the UK, the minimum wage just put huge pressure on, particularly in the subsector of large format stores like House of Fraser, Debenhams, BHS, there's been a lot of pressure on, on, uh, on those types of retailers. But answering the specific question, uh, I think the, the pop-up store thing we've mentioned a couple of times is really important to adopt quickly and technologically it's very easy now to set up a pop-up shop, shop so I think using that as well as social platforms to promote where you are, when, when you are, etc. Um, is a great opportunity for, for smaller brands. Okay. I think we'll say the, is, is there a spoon or not, the very last question if we've got time. So if we move on to the next one, how should we use customer data to enhance the in-store in -store experience the luxury retail, give you the personalised offer for discount, will it be, won't be the right for us? So, yeah, I think I'm badly read that. <laughs> yeah, go on. Um, so, just to explain, uh, so Dropit is a B2B2C uh, platform. Uh, what we do by translating the model of a one-stop shop in the online and creating a network effect, we actually, for the first time, follow the consumer journey. So, most of what we do, we recognise who the shopper is, tourist, local, according to the delivery address, etc. We understand the customer journey, which brands he loves, his average transaction as a whole. And I think um, using the data and the way that the one-stop shops are using the data online, and I think we should differentiate, and I know I keep going back to a network effect, but just to have to have you some, something to think about. Uh, if we have a loyalty card uh, as, a, as a retailer, as a standalone retailer, and it doesn't matter if it's an online sale or an offline sale, we only know what the customer does in our store. But we cannot differentiate him. So if we go together to Gap and we shop and we have a loyalty card offline or online, and they can recognize how we shop in their store, they don't know that when we leave, you go to Prada and I go to H&M and I gave you a compliment. Um, so they don't know to differentiate that he spent a thousand pounds today on his visit and I just spent a hundred in the physical world. So they don't really know how to retarget me on a return and investment kind of base. So I think using data in the physical world to move from the brand awareness marketing strategies that we all see today. So putting a sign in the tube station for two million dollars a year and do not have the ability to understand who's seen it, did they come to the shopping center because of it? How much money did they spend? And how do we communicate with this customer? So this is, um, you know, this is the ability to take the benefits of the one-stop shop online. And because it's the same brands appearing in all the shopping sites in the physical world, we need to start working together and understand who the shopper is. Are we retargeting the right shopper? Is, he, is it worth targeting him? Um, or is it just another waste of a spam email that costs us money? So how do we start optimizing, using data to optimize it? And just another point, and I'm sorry that I'm taking the stage so much, but <laughs> I'm a woman, so yeah. Um, but one of the things that um, that also we can recognize is the problem. Customers today, they get 10 emails in the morning and they just erase them. So we need to move from that. We need to start being more specific um, in our communication channels. and and knowing from the fashion industry at least, they're using the data from the online sector to target their physical shoppers, which is a bit ridiculous because it's the opposite shopper. So we have to think about um, how do we use data, where do we buy it from, and what, what we can learn from it. So. I put that into here that I can see what's behind the panel's heads, and I'm just going to link the last two questions because it's very important here. As technologists, we talked about technology, and the last two questions are, before we come on to is it spoon or not, um, how, how do we connect human, it means your employee with technology, and the, what, with too much technology, are we not forgetting our first roles, the rash of shopkeepers? I think it's important here to remember the people in the store, we want to make it easy for them to engage with the consumer, and we want to make it easy for the consumer to engage in the store. So if we think about it from a human perspective, um, Starting from you, Alex, what does that mean and what does that mean for the in-store experience for both sides of the cash desk? 
Yeah, I think it's really important here to understand what subsets you're in and therefore what all your consumer wants. Because in some uh, some brands, some subsectors like Take Our Lush, for example, there, there just isn't a need for technology. It's great where you just completely free the employee of technology, let them engage with the consumer, and that's worked great for them. Whereas with other brands, technology has worked great, like uh, a lot of shoe retailers and bringing a tablet out, being able to know exactly what size you have in store, that's great because the consumer gets value from that. Uh, and there's no barrier there. So I think just understanding what subsects you're in, really diving deep into consumer research is the first thing you need to do, and then act on that based on if technology will, will benefit. Okay, Igor? Yeah, uh, 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 let me go back to the small and independent companies, yeah, because I mean, Petrovich is, uh, yeah, used to be the, I mean, it is um, the independent, it used to be a small uh, company that started from 2000 uh, years dollars, 15 years ago, and now we are number to a DIY retailer in Russia uh, without any bank loans, without any purchasing uh, uh, mandates and so on. So I mean, we, uh, uh, we grew up uh, with uh, one bright idea. We want to understand the customer journey. What does customer want? So what uh, our clients um, need? And we, we were very brave to, uh, to change consumer behavior and customer journey um, in some point of uh, in, in some points and uh, improve it so be brave and um, uh, don't uh, don't follow the big brands just create the new uh, experience and about the the, the human uh, and, uh, so connecting the employees with the technology uh, I think that uh, the, the, your employee ha have to think about the customers and their needs and don't think about technology at all and uh, uh, from this perspective they will use I mean the employees will use technology to help customers uh, to make customers happy so that's very easy to think about the customers and their needs sorry um, ben. Okay, so when I look at where I think technology has gone and the dehumanization, I think technology has in the past been seen as a disabler, something that puts a barrier between retailer and customer. So take some of the uh, self-service capabilities in the industry, they prevented people actually having a conversation. I can go into a store and nobody knows anything about what I've done other than my till data. So I think we need to put technology back as an enabler to actually work with. So that's why I believe things like mobile and the ability to engage, keep the eyes between customer and retailer, but have a good source of data behind to make that a better experience. That to me is the better use of technology rather than trying to take out high cost, low value transactions and creating a, a challenging experience for the retailer to re-engage with their customer. Thank you very much. I did promise I'd come to the, um, the final question, is there a spoon or not, because it's got five likes. Um, I'm not quite sure what it actually means, so... <laughs> Guys, do you want to have a stab? Is there a spoon or not? No, no, no there is no spoon. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> no spoon. No spoon. Spoon gone. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank the panel. Um, Carrie, Igor, Dan and Alex, thank you very much for your insight. I'm sure they will be hanging around immediately after here if you've got any questions that you want from the panel. Uh, so all remains is thank you very much, thank you very much for the panel.